So today we are going to talk about airflow and machine learning. Uh, I'm going to present this uh, the this meetup. Uh, I'm co-founder CTO of DataBentai. What I do for the last, I think, 16 years, and if, it can, if, I, if I can't get it right, I do data pipelines. I am working with data. I am in all kinds of roles and a, I also work with all kinds of roles. I work with data engineers, I work with data ops, I work with machine learning guys, data science guys, data mining, and so on and so on. Uh, so this is kind of an experience I really want to share with you to share what I know from the past and actually to share what we do right now and how we solve things with Airflow right now. So that's hopefully that will help us in the middle. Uh, let's continue. Okay. So this meetup account is organized using the help of DataBand, our company. We actually actively contribute to Airflow. We have our own uh, open source project, DBND, that interacts with Airflow very nicely. Uh, we have a lot of clients. And I think if it's find us interesting, you just can go to the, our website and get much more information. But today we are going to talk about Airflow. Uh, so, Airflow, uh, Airflow and machine learning. Uh, what you'd like to discuss today, we, will not want, we don't want to have a generic meetup around why Airflow is good. It's good. <laughs> a lot of people using it. We want to see how Airflow actually works for loads that are machine learning. So, the agenda for today is why machine learning workload is different from the regular one was the life cycle of that workload, why Airflow is great and why it's great for machine learning. We will see, we'll review Airflow execution together with machine learning, how it can help us. <coughs> we talk about data and testing. So kind of moving this into production. We talk about metrics monitoring and alerting in all scenarios. And we talk a little bit about our next meetups. Cool, so our account. A, two pictures on the, on this slide. One is presented the pipe and actually how it actually looks. The second one is our dream. I hope after this meetup, after this meetup, we are going to be one step closer to our dream. And so here, machine learning data pipeline. And why is different from any other pipeline? If you take a look on the standard ETL pipeline, a pipeline that transforms data from one database to another, or the, I would even say the standard ingestion pipeline, machine learning data pipeline is going to be different. It's going to be different in few things. First of all, data pipeline that we build for machine learning usually starts from something very simple. We always start from some template that very suitable for some library, but every iteration it starting, it's starting, you start to double the complexity. You start to add more and more steps, more validations, more reports, more data ingestion, more splits, more models. And if the time and every project lives not for one week, but for years and successful machine learning project definitely is for, for multiple years, we see that it starts to be very, very complicated. And usually, but I take, take no, I, I got a chance to, to see some machine learning pipeline with one of, with one of you know, my friends or clients or the cell internally. It's always something big, big and complex. The second thing, but definitely, uh, it's a very significant thing in machine learning pipeline data sources. It's combines a lot of data sources and it always, all these data sources are always changing. So this is very significant property here and the code, if regularly when you wrote some transformation, it does work, it, it just works. The moment you write machine learning, everybody wants to see improvement week by week. So data science guys, um, data science teams will work really hard to improve the precision, the recall that you have inside your pipeline. And that means a lot of code changes, a lot of libraries changes. And then we also talk about dynamic pipelines. You develop one data, one machine learning pipeline for something, and then you will start to replicate that. You will want to run it for different clients, for different data, but also inside the pipeline itself, you will start to have 
all kind of complexity. We would like to run multiple iterations of some model. We would like to split the data in different ways. We would like to fetch the data from different sources. So it's very dynamic. And then what comes in is the unique resource requirements. So you have a pipeline. It works really great if you're standard technical machine learning library, some Python code, and then somebody comes in and says, let's, let's try to do deep learning. And then we need to do some training that requires GPU or just your standard library. It grows so fast and you need some much more memory and actually your standard airflow node doesn't support it. So memory requirement, and it's very expensive. It's very expensive from all these <coughs> properties because it's complex, a lot of people changing code. So it's like, there is huge price to pay for the development. There is huge price to pay for the compute. And there's probably a big price to pay for the mistake that your machine learning model will make if something will go wrong. Okay. Uh, I didn't say it's in the beginning of the meeting, a, in our meetup, the webinar, a, I would like to have, you know, very, <laughs> even you know, in, the, in this format, it's really hard to do it. Like, feel free to ask questions. If I don't see them on chat, Honor will let me know. So I'll try to answer. So whatever questions you have, start to write down them inside the chat. And I'll pause between slides just to review and, you know, reply immediately to what we, what we just discussed. And also at the end of the session, I will have time for a long QA session. So it's the first thing. Second thing I think I want to mention that this is a you know, this is a webinar, so we are not going to go into the very deep details of something. It's much like the blog post is much better form for that. We have covered few points in our blog post, so we can find it on our web, website. Uh, and at the same time, the moment if you're going to be interested in something, it's a great signal for us and we might write a nice blog post around something that you have asked. So also ask our, ask us questions. Uh, cool, just checking what questions here. We still don't have any questions, great. Um, so this is the, so what you have right now on this slide, it's a standard, no, all of us understand that pipelines, machine learning pipelines are complicated. This is why we are here. We're trying to solve that. That's nice. But what we also need to discuss, and this is, this is something simplified the presentation of, of stuff, how machine learning pipelines are also different from in the life cycle from what we run regularly inside Airflow. Airflow is very focused on the stage free. It's kind of, we need to run some pipeline in scale in production. What actually happens with machine learning pipeline, it have a lot of stages in its life. In this presentation, very simple right now, what I'm now representing here, but it's good enough to, it's good enough for our discussion. So let us see it. Stage one, I started to write my pipeline. I have a script. I'm doing something inside it. I use Jupyter Notebook. I'm starting very small. And at that step, for me, it's very important to see my progress. I'm less focused on how I'm going to create a pipeline out of it, how I'm going to move to the production that's focused on the quality of my model. I want to have a really nice working POC. But if I'm going to be effective, and <laughs> hopefully I will, I will start to move that thing into production very quickly. And then I start to split parts of my Jupyter notebook into more reusable things. I will start to think about reusability. I will start to think about testing so I can actually test before I move into production. And then production will come and then retraining. Usually at what I see, what I see definitely people retrain their pipelines at least once a week. And nowadays, like daily is a common thing. Hourly is a common thing. And sometimes it's even more. Monitoring, we have it's once like, you know, every company had one to five nice important pipelines. Right now we have hundreds. So that's important part of the production and then multi-environment. Uh, today I had experience to work on some multi-cloud environments. So something that works in GCP, then they move it to AWS as well and, and back. So it's, it's happened. So <clears throat> after what I have said, 
So why airflow is good for, for machine learning? It's like, it's a good question, right? It's like airflow is a data pipeline framework, orchestration tool, it's great. So why is it good for machine learning? Why with all these differences? So let us review it. First of all, it's Apache Airflow, right? Now, if five years ago, it was kind of the say very new <laughs> young library, all of us were very excited to use. Now it's something fundamental. Everybody uses Apache Airflow. And it's a brand, it's like, I don't think it's a, it's a good brand. I know <laughs> it's not some like, you know, like a nice brand, like Versace or Gucci and, were, and sometimes you see it on the TV. This is something we use day to day and it's a good brand. We familiar with this, we have a good experience with this one. And I think this is a good thing. So this is a good starting point. Now actually let's see how it can, how can it solve the things that we have discussed. So first of all, it's Python. The definition of pipelines are Python. And this is great because most of our code is going to be Python. The second thing, the system itself is Python. So that's today when I, like, when I was reviewing my presentation, I wanted to clarify on something. So I went to documentation. It was a nice documentation. I got something for that, but then I wanted to understand something explicitly how it works. I just went to the source code and it's a huge opportunity to have. So something doesn't work, we go to source code, but if it's something even works, we can understand much more from the source code and the, it's Python, so it's great. It's getting better with the time. You know, it's already, let's call it seven years old by the open source. So it's better and better. And <coughs> huge library of operations, of operators. Uh, there is SaaS version for Airflow on every major cloud provider. And I see people moving to that, uh, to that thing. A lot of guides, a lot of blog posts, a lot of best practices, a Apache 2.0 2, 2 and new things. So from all we can own, it's, it's a good thing. And I think this, this thing can handle machine learning. So now it probably it's time to go into more details and start to go one by one and see how it works. A, another probably disclaimer for this presentation, uh, our assumption that you have used Airflow in the past. So if you are here, you use Airflow in the past, and if you don't, I, I think you can still stay with us and you learn a lot. And probably from our examples, you'll see, you will learn something about Airflow which will help you to onboard on it later. So <clears throat> first of all, let's start from the big, big graphs, right? I started my presentation from that nice picture, big graph, very complicated graph. How, can Airflow handle that graph? So the answer is yes. If one year ago to handle a graph of 100 tasks, it was a task for machine learning guy to write the pipeline. And then it was a good task for platform guy to maintain that graph, to make sure that schedule can actually handle that big graph, to have a you know, big enough Postgres database, big enough schedule node, so that can happen. Nowadays, it's much more simple. Airflow 2.0 has high availability inside its schedule. So Airflow can handle graphs with 50 nodes and 100 nodes and even more. It's almost horizontal scale. There's only a small portion of the schedule that actually like locking, so it's a you know, it's a small bottleneck, but it's not a bottleneck anymore. And so this is the thing. So if you have big graphs, machine learning, you probably have you have to enable high availability on scheduler. Now, previous solution was also the kind of to start to push big graphs, and when too big, scheduler cannot handle it, so we can do subdeck. So subdeck still exists; you still can use it, but by default, this subdeck will run sequential execution make sure you know what you're doing. So it means you can push a big portion of the big graph into the subdeck, but the subdeck itself will run like a step by step. It will provide us a nice UI. So it's well, much nicer as a, as a graph, but the execution experience is not that good and the UX experience is not that good as well. So what the solution, task group. This is a new feature. I'm not sure how many of you are already using that, that's a nice thing to group big graphs on your main, you know, on your main graph representation. And that helps to manage them a lot. Okay. Um, 
Let's just checking. Uh, okay, this is some questions. I think actually Honor is right. I'm going to answer on the question about CPU and GPU on the next in few next slides. Okay, cool. So this is about the big graphs. So they kind of covered to feel comfortable of running machine learning on airflow. Now dynamic ducks. So it starts from very strict duck definition, and that's great. It helps us to onboard a lot of people. Usually, what you know, if once I was saying airflow as kind of not very flexible duck definition, right now I would say it has a great duck definition because it's really easy for somebody new to write airflow duck, and that's a great point. But then we move into production. And we don't want to offer that completely manually. It's code, but it's like it's a very declarative code, and you don't do anything. So you start to generate that. We have multiple examples. How can we generate that? So it's still not a dynamic DAG. It's a DAG defined you know, during the, the running of the of, of your file. Now, what's actually what I define as the, as the dynamic DAG is something that changed a lot from execution to execution. <clears throat> and that starts to be a problem that we need to discuss, need to understand, and there is a solution for that. So the moment your graph changes between different runs, and that might happen when you do machine learning a lot, because you start to parameterize your graph and you change the number of steps in some for loop, you change number of sources, you want to play with sources, you change number of days of data that you're taking and so on and so on. So the graph starts to change. <clears throat> and what we need to be aware of that Airflow right now have a limitation that it saves that representation inside its database. And this is the latest DAC that were executed by Airflow. So this is not DAC file that exists inside web server and it needs to run every time like it was one year ago, but it's still latest presentation of the DAC. So the moment you start to change your DAC, it will affect all previous executions of the DAC. So now we know about limitation, how we're going to solve it. Okay. First of all, um, this is the you know, we can, I, I think I, <laughs> before we go how to solve it, we need to also discuss how can actually control it. So the easiest way to control your DAC, how you, call it, how you create it is using variables. You don't need to go to external database, don't need to do anything, you know. You don't need to define extra company to manage your DACs. If you define the DAC and you want to control how it looks, you can actually use variables. So the moment you use variable, every time you run the DAC, it can be created the right way and it can be used, okay? Now, the good technique here will be, first of all, if you don't want to run something, is not to remove it from the graph, but to mark it as a skipped step, okay? So your graph doesn't change, it just have more skips on the graph. The another technique in case your graph changes a lot to maintain it is actually to push down the dynamic part into the operator. It can be subduct with all the limitations or just a regular operator. From what I have seen, <clears throat> usually people try to use this dynamic that thing to move the to like optimize their computations. And this is a thing that can be always solved by using the right engine. So if you have a big computation, so instead of starting to parallelize your Python using the dynamic duck, just move and use Spark for that. And especially specifically if you're on cloud, that's not a huge issue. Find the right engine try to keep things simple on the Airflow side. There's also work around using external libraries, like DBND is going to be one of them, when you can actually create and run and manage dynamic tasks. Okay, resource management. So I think it's uh, one of the questions I have, seen, I have seen in our chat. So it's definitely when you run machine learning, one of the biggest things that people start to ask you know, immediately, does Airflow support GPU? So Airflow itself, it's not a system. Let's make sure we have all of us on the same page. Airflow itself is not the system that were built and created to manage GPU machine, like machines with GPU or GPU nodes. 
uh, to run our deep learning jobs. At the same time, it's a generic execution system and has all things required to build a right abstraction on top of your physical nodes a, to run our pipelines. And let's discuss it. So first of all, let's see the problem when I can usually what from my experience, but the, the, the first thing we need, we need definitely need the node with the GPU. Second thing we need, we need Python. Usually, if we will run Python code there, Python code is going to wrap or it's going to be the job itself. The thing here starts to be more complicated because it's not just a regular Python to read from one database to another database. It's going to be some you know, advanced Python with advanced libraries. So requirements TXT is very important here. What we were going to run there, what exactly version of TensorFlow, what exact version of everything else is very important and we're going to change it a lot. So there's significant changes in packages. So, and all this thing is all about, you know, in Airflow is all about deployment and executor. Okay. So now these are requirements. We want to be able to use GPU nodes. We want to be able to change our Python and be in control in charge of our Python. And we want to do it kind of in an easy way. We don't want to spend too much time. So let's think together what we have in Airflow first. And, I can, and the most common deployment that we'll see in Airflow is going to be some deployment. I just wrote here Kubernetes deployment because I just see it more and more with the availability of the community chart, official chart, some other charts. That's really great. People start to deploy Airflow. And then the executor still in use is salary execute. Even in lot, most of SaaS deployments, what we'll see, it's going to be salary executor. So first of all, we need to separate, in order to discuss how can we support GPU and Python, we need to separate what you mean by deployment and executor, okay? So here's the thing. When we deploy Airflow, we deploy web server, we deploy scheduler, and we might deploy some workers. And that's a deployment. Then we need some executor. So scheduler, we use executors. The moment scheduler will run, it will start to trigger uh, tasks, actions, and the scheduler is going to use the executor which was pre-configured for it. There's only one executor per schedule. We cannot configure multiple executors per schedule. And that's good, but we're going to define how we're going to run our jobs. Okay. So now let's take a look on seller. So this slide. What seller can do? It can run many deploy salary executor. The part of deployment will be a salary system with all kinds of you know, salary components, so result back and queue broker, flower to control it, and a lot of other stuff. And then it will take no, it will provide to Airflow a way to manage its workers, its salary workers. So scheduler will use salary executor as well. It's a proxy to the salary execution system. So bottom line, your actions, your operators, your tasks will run on workers. So I want to run GPU. I can say for the I can say for during the execution that I want to send to a very specific queue of seller. I will have to deploy that queue of workers that will run on GPU nodes. Okay. So every GPU node will have one worker because you know, sharing GPU is, is still a problematic thing. A, okay, this in this deployment. So I will I can signal seller executor, but the queue that we have to use is going to be some GPU queue, and then all GPU will go there. Okay. Now, this is kind of the only resource management I got. I cannot define memory. I cannot the amount of memory I want. I cannot define other properties. So on one hand, this is a very bulletproof system salary how oh, it works for airflow for multiple deployments all SaaS deployments work for it 
On the other hand, I can run it you know, on GPU, but bottom line, it has limited resource man management. So if I just need to have a pool of GPU workers, I can do it here. Okay, so this is the one way of using that directly. So I don't have a worker that's, that's, that's talking to my GPU resource. It's like actually working running on GPU resource and we use that to run the Python code that will run my training. What's important here to remember, we use pools inside Airflow and there are queues, it's not the same. Queues are only for salary and pools is the internal resource management of Airflow itself. Okay, so take a look on documentation. Okay. So this is the one way. So we're going to another way, so stay tuned. So now- Evgeny, uh, really quickly, we have one question that came in. Um, Imri asked, how would you recommend to control the dependencies on Airflow workers for ML jobs? Okay, uh, so let's let's go here. Uh, I think let's, let's, let's get back to this question in two slides. I can decide in the next one, and then we have a general. You'll, you'll know what context I have, how to manage it, and then we can actually discuss how can we do it, okay? So here there's another executor, and that's already, it's, the answer is somewhere here, like a container tag, so we can talk about the dependencies, but we'll go into the, this question in a few minutes. So Kubernetes deployment plus Kubernetes executor. So if in the previous deployment, I could just deploy using Kubernetes, I could deploy Celery, and Celery will manage everything, so everything was very simplified for me. Now, Airflow actually has a Kubernetes executor that can be in charge of direct communication with, with Kubernetes and submitting your workload there. So now if you take a look on the right side, this is the task configuration you can provide to every task. And that will, this will represent how much memory I want, how much CPU ammo I want, and what actually image I want to run with this, when I run this job. Okay. Uh, that image still have to contain oh, airflow. So it's not the system don't image. So this is real, real Kubernetes execution. That's nice. If you take a look on the diagram here, it's like it, it doesn't care where it deployed the airflow UI and the web server and the schedule does have to be deployed. Right now for the, in this slide, I use the Kubernetes deployment, but you can use whatever you want. But the thing is right now is that Kubernetes executor, every time it will run your pod, it will kind of create a thermal worker inside the new pod. It will run your job. And then that worker will finish and get back to Kubernetes executor and it will start to run Next, uh, next task. So first of all, it's great for real resource management. It's great to run a lot of pods if you have a really big cluster, okay? But it has some limitations. First of all, it's much more closer to Kubernetes. So you will have to take care of logs. You will have to take care a lot about a lot of things. And usually what from I have seen I think right now in the audience here, we have guys who do data engineering jobs, who do machine learning jobs, so all kinds of jobs, but still like, you know, the knowledge around Kubernetes, around the like, you know, organizations are still very limited. So being able to log into the pod, being able to check what's happened there, pods are very thermal here, it's a complexity. And especially when you have something that fails very quickly because of the wrong library and it removes the pod, and you have zero visibility on what happened there, it's hard to maintain. So it's nice on the POC level. It's really great for you know, staging, something you know, what you can run when you have, you're very close to it, but then it goes to production. The maintenance cost of this deployment is much, much more high. Okay. Uh, so now let's actually back to the question. So how to manage dependencies here, right? So the container tag, what I had here, it's still the image that will run as a worker that will trigger my job. Okay. So it's still have to have all the requirements from Airflow, all the requirements from my machine learning job. I need to manage it so somehow to manage it. More than that, if I go back here, so every worker needs to have 
all required packages installed on the work. Now that sounds easy. Like in all case, I, I definitely can install all required packages on the worker. The problem is what happens when I want to update the model and I want to update the model library only for my new deck, not for everybody. So options are good. I can create another Airflow cluster. That's a bad idea. Uh, I can create a new queue here. Hard to do, but possible. Oh, I can just somehow find the window. Then I will move all my workers from one image to another. If I just do seller executor, it run directly my job. So what's interesting here is also this option. You can run Dockerized sections. And what I have seen, and I'm going to discuss it even more in the next slides, for machine learning jobs, separating between machine learning load you know, machine learning pipeline, the pipeline definition, and what actually runs inside it is not something very, very bad. You know, I personally don't like it a lot, but this is the reasonable solution to manage your requirements. So your dockerized action is some cube Kubernetes operator that will trigger job. It will have very specific image. It will have very specific requirements and salary or local executor or any other executor will stay in touch. So only when you change libraries that will use to build your deck, you will have to update them. And that will happen much more. Not, not, not so often. Okay. <clears throat> okay, that's me. I'll go back to, I'll go back to questions later. So let us uh, continue here. Uh, what interesting thing here is actually we can run <laughs> oh a good thing from both worlds we can do salary Kubernetes executor so that's a nice thing that's a thing that can enables us to run salary executor by default you know all jobs will go to salary and the moment I will use for some operators Q equal to Kubernetes it will automatically use Kubernetes Executor, but will send jobs into using Kubernetes Executor using this configuration. And that's nice. Okay. Last thing to remember here, if you do this approach, dockerized actions, like you will do Kubernetes operator inside your pipeline. And then you say, guys, so this dice, okay, I separated layers. I have orchestration pipeline and I have Kubernetes operator. The moment you will start to use Kubernetes executor, you are going to overpay to your cloud provider. And this can be, it might be a problem for your company. You will have a worker pod that will take resources. And if it's big pipelines, it take a lot of resources, a lot of pods like this. But the only thing they will do, they will run code that will submit your image defined the operator to another pod. So you, you wrote a DAG. Inside DAG, there is a Kubernetes operator. You run it on Kubernetes executor. And effectively, you'll see two pods running for every operator. So moving to the next slide. So before we actually continue to talk about data and other stuffs and actually what we discussed so far, mostly focusing on the production stage, like you know, how we do it in production. Maybe you can use it for staging, for testing, but how we use it in production. Now we actually want to see how we can do what we do also for stage one, stage two, and how Airflow can help us. If you want to, if you want Airflow to help us, we definitely need to understand what we are running. So we run pipelines, everybody knows. Now what we actually run inside every operator is your code definitely with all the requirements and stuff that we discussed with the image. So it's your code and compute. This is, the, this is what we control. But then we also need to control all parameters that come in, right? It's very important for every and every machine learning job. We need to control data that come in. 
and that's even more important for every machine learning job. And I think that it will produce some metrics and some data, okay? The simplest representation of that process is going to be here. You can see it, prepare data, data come in, data come out. This is something that I do inside. Okay, so you can even map it to the code. So now, if before it was very, you know, just make a choice, you have this kind of load or you have this kind of you know, requirements, run salary cluster because you have simple Python code, not too much memory requirements. You have a big machine learning jobs that require a lot of memory. Start to consider a Kubernetes executor because then you can ask for huge pods and that's really, you know, so you can do memory management there or GPU. Uh, this was very simple. Now it's things are going to talk here are much more contradictive. It's like, there is no best practices here. It's good or bad, it's not best. And it taps with spaces. There are people who will say, I always do spaces. And there are people who will say, I always do taps. I personally do what is required. Uh, from our, well, from my experience, again, inside our company, uh, we have a lot of airflow clusters right now. And for also the, you know, for my friends, and I, I usually like to talk about Airflow <laughs> with a lot of people and the companies we work with, what we see, oh, there are all kinds of solutions and most of them are right. And that's the way how we implement it. So let's talk about what we have. So now we start to talk less about execution, but more about the data, what actually power our machine learning pipeline, what actually moves from step to step, it actually might be correct for ingestion pipelines, but here in machine learning pipelines, especially when they have so many people writing them, they start to be very, very important. So what I have seen numerous times, and more than twice, I can all production clusters were killed by Xcode very easily. And now let's one step back. What is Xcode? Xcode is the thing that enable us to communicate between different operators. The moment operator finish do something and I want to communicate its result to the next operator or location of the result or something, I will use XCOM. That's a great technique that we have inside Airflow. It simplifies all the thing and we use it for a lot of years. Okay, so XCOM is kind of the bus that come from one operator to another. What is less exciting about XCOM is that actually this is not you know, a real Kafka bus or some nice bus that can <laughs> move your data from one place to another. No, it is a table inside Airflow database and it behaves as a table. So the moment your code, your Python operator, for some reason will have returned my huge, big fat data frame, your database, you store it, okay? And then it will be stored inside the database and that's maybe okay for one run and for the second run, but if you run your thing every day and you have multiple operations, it's going to kill your database very short. It's not even about the performance, about the number of connections, that's, not, that, that's the capacity, okay? And that's the, if it's in cloud, that's the side, that's the EBS, operations and, and stuff like that. So vanilla XCOM is a great thing, but then we start, we start to work with machine learning. In machine learning, a lot of things are Python and in Python, people like to keep things in memory and things in memory can get into the return statement. And then that's, no, that's might be dangerous. It's also different on different DDP engines. There is some, limitations in some operators trying not to save too big values to XCOM, but bottom line, just pickling your object and pushing it inside XCOM. Now, for the solution, right? <laughs> so you still keep using XCOM. Right now, there is no official, I think, you know, a XCOM, a XCOM implement, different XCOM implementation, but first of all, you can use your own custom XCOM implementation, and that's great. And I already have seen at least two different implementation, S3 and GCP, that enables us to save data in XCOM and also on the cloud storage. And that means big objects, data frames, go into the cloud storage, small objects go into XCOM. And then you can see 
You can use still Airflow UI, UX, your all pipelines works. That's great. So then we know how to manage data inside our pipelines, how to test our pipelines. And now, so when you start from production, it's like how to test. When I start from the first stage, I just finished my script, how actually to productize. So far, it's like there are two options. First option, people have a very defined flow that can uh, commit your DAG. Some sites, CCI sites, some sites, this, this system will pick up it, it will test the DAG, it will push it to the right place, I will share the drive, and then production airflow will see it and it start to run. You'll be able to manually trigger the DAG. <coughs> what we do for ourselves, actually, we use Docker Compose to run local airflow and to test our DAGs. It's very simple. Is definitely requires to maintain Docker Compose deployment of Airflow and production deployment. But at the same time, I think this duplication of deployments for the simplicity uh, and the debugability of the process. So you can always run our DAX locally, check what happened, see how it works, develop, you know, iterate around it. Second thing is staging. I don't think that uh, I have seen real production airflow without staging. At the same time, well, sometimes staging is not well maintained, people skipping on that, staging running, something very, very, very simple. So staging is really important. Staging should run almost production decks. It can be some different different intervals, you know, staging have a huge value. It can prevent a lot of bugs and this is what we do. Uh, actually, DAC management, I don't think that we, have, we would focus today on DAC management because it's less relevant for the machine learning. It is a generic airflow problem that have to be, you know, there are a lot of solutions here. So let's pause here. But regarding local server and staging, if you actually want that people will be able to cannot be in charge of their pipelines, machine learning pipelines. They have to be able to run their pipelines end to end. And this is the two things that enables us to do that. Uh, so we talked about XCOM. We talked about how you want to test. You want to have a local deployment, Docker Compose, just you, know, you can run Airflow. The init script is simple. If, my, if it's Python, so usually it's good enough, uh, the different cases maybe maybe not always work. And then we talked about how we can use staging. So then this question is going to come. It's like every every project, every big project that existed Fairflow, specifically project who who started three or five years ago, they will have something around it. And usually, if I talk to guys, like, you know, how, how big is Airflow deployment? Like, how do you use it? Say, you have a lot of code around it. And that a lot of code around it is usually something around here. Because this is the thing. What we need to know that Apache Airflow wasn't developed to solve it. Apache Airflow was developed to run pipelines, to run sequence of steps, step A, step B, step C, that will execute in the, you know, in the right order. With the right with the right compute, and this was the main purpose of this tool. Now it's changing. Like you know, we personally contributed to AP forty one. It's about like you know how to connect functions and connect data between them, so you don't need to worry about the data connectivity. But still, data versioning is not there because we used XCOM for that, and XCOM doesn't support version. So it's on you to implement it. And there are, it can be a multiple ways of doing it. First of all, if you talk about machine learning pipelines, most of the thing inside Airflow based on execution date. So you can trigger, you can use unique execution date every time for unique pipeline, for unique iteration. And you can say this way your results are going to be safe. It's a simple, straightforward version. 
then you start you can start to use custom xcom this is what actually we're doing inside with the dbd library we like to optimize around it we like to inject different paths every time we run something we can do parameters in ginger no ginger macros you can use external libraries but you cannot skip it for your machine learning pipeline so Previous question, you need to implement data management layer. You need to take care of compute. And now there is a pipeline and we talk about the dockers. So how can I combine all this together? And again, we on this lecture, I really want to share my experience, not sure you know, this is a good fit for everybody. And we don't have too many ways to get the feedback from you. So guys, first of all, you can share on the channel. I will read it out. Uh, but here, so should a separate orchestration on ML code? This is a great question. I have seen more, like some really great medium posts around it. Are people one can like, you know, one of the medium posts was strongly for separation because it simplifies things. Some of them are against. So I personally really like to keep things together because it's really easy when you manage your pipeline code and your actual code, and you don't need to manage two different systems. At the same time, I definitely want to acknowledge that it's much easier to manage execution environment to have this separation. So if you're struggling with execution environment management, that might be a solution. You write your code, you change libraries, nobody's affected. When, especially when you have a huge airflow server but inside, inside the organization, that can be a solution. The moment you do it, it's going to be hard to communicate with the sub process sections. So like every time you separate, you have something with runs dockers, with runs your process. So you start to move parameters from your pipeline into your code using strings, using a lot of spaghetti code, but that's the price you have to pay. And it's again, it's like even maybe some places it's going to be hard to test. So that was like an uncertainty. We didn't know what to do there. It's always a big question to make decision for every project, even like for the pro for the current project. Should you move to different approach? Should you keep the current approach? But these things that we're going to talk right now are going to be, you know, they definitely going to be right, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> and it, I want to talk if I have like five, five minutes to talk about them. Uh, okay. Let's start. So metrics and alerting. So usually people talk about airflow, especially engineers. We like to focus on the airflow cluster, on the executors, on how we integrate with Kubernetes, how we do integration with our authorization system, authentication system, how we can also, how we optimize something and stuff like that. But the real value of the machine learning projects come from what it does. And the only way to see that is actually some metrics, okay? So when we talk about how to productize machine learning projects inside Aeroflow, it's really important thing to make sure that what we do inside Aeroflow is communicated outside of the Aeroflow. And that might be some metrics for the model or for the uh, some input size maybe, or there can be some alerts that you can see on the right screen. So I can have it on some alert propagated and can be notified. Okay, so the metrics and alerting. So the easiest way, okay, usually engineers like Niels, okay, so let's enable you now metrics for airflow and they will do this thing. But the truth is that this thing is probably the first thing people need to do for the airflow cluster, but it's not a solution for what we're trying to achieve right now. This is the operational state of the cluster. It actually says how is your cluster is healthy. It has no idea if your pipeline is healthy. So log your metrics, log your business metrics. You can use a kind of simple, stupid Python logging. We do it. Okay. Better thing, Grafana. I think it's problematic. You have a blog post around it, but I think it's still better than it's much better than anything you know, than just not doing logging at all. So log your things to Grafana or to Kibana, to, to Elasticsource stack. Then 
use experimentation management is still problematic. Or also that you can, what you can do, you can use special libraries to do that. So it's also an option, but that's the visibility that you need to get from a Python. If you talk about machine learning Python. So you need to see what happening in with the data. You need to see what happening with the data quality, data operations and data health. Okay, so if it does now, I know what this is. We're coming to the end of our hour. So if 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 you know, I would I would like to finish with some fun fun recipe here. Uh, what we need to do in order to have a you know, a great machine learning pipeline inside our Airflow. This is the recipe that I have, and I think most of you also have. But I really value with a lot of I see a lot of people, forty four people. Oh, now it's forty three already. <laughs> so it's a it's a it's a it's end of the uh, end of the hour join this session to see how we solve it. And actually, I think you use this time also to think how you solve it. So this is the recipe all of us have in our minds. And this I want to share it. So it's like, first of all, we definitely need to use fresh ingredients, <laughs> not frozen food, right? To have a, we need to have a healthy and fresh data. So the data visibility, if you do machine learning pipelines is very, very important. We need to add a lot of abstraction out of our data. So we can have data versioning. So I can keep all my results and you know what happened, I know to get back to my data and so on and so on. We need a good execution. And we talked about it. There are a good way to get that. And there are a good way to configure that. We try notifications alerts. And we need to test the results all the time. We cook something in our machine learning pipeline. So we need to see KPIs. So I think it's the end of the <laughs> of this meetup. So this, I will use this one second to say we Databund is hiring. We we are growing and we are looking for more people to join us. We are building really great data observability pipeline. Sorry, not a platform. <laughs> it's the end of the hour and they late here in Israel. But this is what we do. We have a lot of happy clients and we want to extend and we want to find really great guys to help us build it. And what we also do, we contribute to Airflow community. So if you join us, you'll be part of us and you'll contribute to Airflow community as well. So now back to questions. I see one question around the maintain project specific DAGs in different locations. Is there a better way than the DAG back? Can you please suggest? So right now, you know, I don't think there's a good way to manage or disappear. There is a good way to manage DAGs in different locations because the DAG back itself right now, it reads all DAGs from the same location, right? So like, you know, physically the DAG back is going to look for a very specific location and it's going to see what happened there. The thing is you can abstract in that location, all other locations and make sure that coming into this location the dark back can see it. So now, as I know, the only way for Airflow to read that, to understand how your graph look inside worker or scheduler and to start executing that, it has to be inside your dark back. And the dark back is going to be based on the Python files. It will find in the specific folder. Okay, so that's what I know. If you can definitely find the ways to so oh. a different way of doing that, you can inject probably some Python file that can grab more ducks from different locations, for example. So you can have a, I would call it an anchor. You put some Python file. So the moment Airflow does a duck back importing that file, it actually will bring a lot of files from different locations, from locations that you want to, oh, to manage. So that can be one, or, one solution for your question. Cool. So first of all, thank you everybody for coming today. Uh, I hope it was an interesting meeting for you, meeting for you. I enjoyed a lot talking about it. Talk, uh, and I see you on the next meeting.